number two ATS Octu in the United Kingdom, seven CWAC cadets graduate. After the grueling course of instruction, they are in tip-top form as they do their stuff for the inspecting officers. The march past is led by Therese Vanier, the senior cadet of the present British Octu class. This is the first time a Canadian girl has had the honor of being elected senior cadet by her fellow officer candidates. Canada's latest lieutenants can hardly wait to replace the white braid with the shiny pit, symbolic of their commission. After sealing the police pocket, the 1st Canadian Army commences a tremendous drive for the River Seine. With the 7th German Army in disorganized flight, the tactics are to account for as many as possible of the depleted divisions. Canadian armor and infantry press forward in an all-out pursuit to bring them to bay at the Seine. French natives hail their liberators as our carriers forge down the open road. Loyal Frenchmen are quick to lay hands on the collaborators and to deal with them summarily. Hardly have our advance parties passed by before civilians commence moving their belongings back to their homes. In their headlong flight, the enemy has not had time to set mines or booby traps. The landscape is littered with abandoned equipment, which in many cases finds its way into some peasant cottage. Even ducks fatten themselves up for the victory meal. Farm carts and horses were commandeered by the retreating army. All means of escape were attempted in the flight to the German border. Our planes blasted them, leaving behind only good Germans, dead Germans. As the drive nears the river, the terrible effect of our artillery and aerial bombardment becomes apparent. Mechanized vehicles and guns of all kind are crushed as by a giant hand. Working in closer support of the advancing Canadian Army, the Air Force displays uncanny skill in eliminating masses of densely packed enemy transport. The road back to Nazi land is a bloody one. The escape route across the River Seine has been under aerial fire for some time. With the majority of the enemy eliminated from West Bank pockets, Royal Canadian engineers hastily devise methods of ferrying equipment to the far bridgehead. Modern motorized craft are used to speed pursuit. Working night and day, bridging companies throw great pontoon bridges across the Seine. They are capable of carrying even our heaviest armor. With bridgeheads firmly established, the main body of Canadians pours across the Seine at El Bœuf. Swinging to the left, the axis of advance moves to the famed city of Joan of Arc, Blois. Bypassed by Canadian armor in its ceaseless pursuit of the German 7th Army, Rouen is invested by infantry in light Bren carriers. The war-scarred Rouen Cathedral still points a spire to the sky, as though pronouncing a benediction. Troops hurry forward on their mission of retribution. <laughs> Scenes of great rejoicing are found everywhere in the liberated city. Crowds go wild as the whole town turns out to express their joy at deliverance. Joy is mingled with 
outrage as feeling runs high against those people who forgot they were French. They are shorn and branded. Meanwhile, Canadians press forward on their urgent mission of liberation, leaving behind the cheers of liberated Rouen. On Thursday, June 15th, London again becomes the target for a blitz from the air. Nine days after D-Day, the Nazis start their flying bomb attacks. Night and day, the attacks continue. On some days, as many as 200 flying bombs are launched, causing many casualties and much property damage. Special demolition squads of the Royal Canadian Engineers join other civil and military groups in the rescue work. A vital task is theirs, which must be performed at top speed. Under the ruins are trapped civilians whose lives may be saved if the debris is cleared in time. Mobile canteens, many of them Canadian, do yeoman duty in refreshing weary rescue crews. An hour seldom goes by without the sirens wailing the alert and the roar of bombs signaling another job to be done. London is again on the front lines, but she demonstrates that these senseless attacks can have no effect on the outcome of the war. New methods of defense are tried and adopted. ak ak guns and balloons are moved to better positions. The defense system becomes so effective that in the 80-day bombardment, only 2,300 bombs of the 8,000 launched ever reach London. at a height of about 2,000 feet and a speed of around 350 miles per hour. Special Air Force interceptor squadrons maintain ceaseless control and master the knack of exploding them in the air. Command are out in great force. They continue to seek out and blast the highly camouflaged launching bases in France. The launching bases can be found. The launching bases can be blasted from the ground. As the blitz against the buzz bomb moves into its final phase, Allied troops drive into the Pas de Calais area. One by one, the launching sites are overrun. As Canadian and Allied troops drive the Germans from each one, the bombardment of London diminishes in proportion. All that is left of the launching bases is just a mass of wreckage. Less than 60% of the bombs left the French coast. Many of them fell around the sites, making the launching a hazardous business. In a wrecked concrete blockhouse is found a chart of routes to target areas, to the capital which took the force of the attack. The firing handle will launch no more explosive death against innocent civilians. The buzz bomb is finished. There may still be another secret weapon, but Allied brains can beat it, and London can take it. <laughs> <laughs>